be a slightly higher level overview than some of the talks we've had today, but I thought I'd give you a feel for what we're trying to do and some of the challenges we've had in training. So first of all, in New Zealand our cows are outside. There's about 4.9 million of them and they're scattered pretty well over the country. We are based in Waikato, so in the North Island, uh, around the middle. And that's where 22% of the cows are, and that's kind of the biggest concentration of dairy cows. There weren't a lot in the South Island until the 1990s, and now there's about 42% of the herd down there. So about 90, or about 82% of the diet on average is pasture, but there's quite a lot of farms that would be solely pasture fed, and there'll be some other farms that might be 30% supplement feeding. But the cows would generally still be outside, so there's a handful of entire confinement farms in the whole country. Our breed mix is quite different, so most of our, or the majority of our population, are Holstein Frisian Jersey cross animals, with a number of purebred Holstein Frisians and about 10% Jerseys, and a smattering of other breeds. So LIC is a farmer cooperative, and between us and CRB, which is a Dutch cooperative, we have about 90% market share. We do get some US and other countries semen into the country, but you can imagine with the production systems being quite different, that those genetics don't always necessarily sort, like suit, so you kind of want to test them out slowly. So our numbers up here look quite kind of similar in terms of the 2050 targets compared to Ireland, but we need to reduce methane by 10% by 2030, and the target for 2050 is somewhere between 24 and 47%. And these are targets set by government. The precise 2050 target will depend on kind of what technologies we and others can come up with in the next few years. So in terms of genetics, we're not going to really do anything by 2030. We are aiming to make a significant contribution <coughs> for 2050. And that picture here is pretty typical of the kind of environment our bulls are on. That's the bull farm. So when they're not on our trial, they're out grazing and grazing past. So CRV breeding program is pretty similar to this, but on a slightly smaller scale. So about 2,000 bulls are genotyped each year, and we use genomic prediction to figure out which bulls we're going to buy, and then they come on farm to LIC. So the bulls would typically be born between about July and September. There might be a few born in the autumn, which is around March in New Zealand. So they arrive on site for LIC and CRV around December, so they're around that six months of age. And we do those, the methane measurements between February and June at LIC, and then we move all the equipment over to CRV and do the methane measurements there. So they're fairly young animals, but they are proper developed ruminants. And what's quite unique about semen in New Zealand is very much the majority is fresh semen, so our breeding period kind of runs from October through to December. So peak season we'll be shipping 160,000 fresh spores a day. So we can use each bull a lot more heavily than when you're doing frozen because the dose rate's a lot lower. So this is my pet project. We built the barn especially for our methane project. If I'd thought about it a bit more, I would have put a nice overhang to stop the rain coming in the front two pens. But the things you learn over time. So there's eight pens in there. Each pen's nine by six metres. And each pen's got a green feed and two feed and take bins. And they're the Hocko Farm Rick bins. We've got the brand new version that they've had. And that's been a bit of a learning experience when they didn't have any kind of user manuals or anything quite developed yet. 
So we put up to 12 bulls per pen. 12 bulls kind of at the start, and we get down to about 9 or 10 bulls at the end, just depending on how big those bulls are. The, concrete, the floors are all concrete, but we do have rubber matting at the front, outside the feet and hip bins, and then bedding at the back. <coughs> and they've got ad lib access to feed, and I'll talk a bit more about feed and rooms. So, this is our first green feed, so that was number 176. That arrived in 2020, just as COVID was hitting. Our timing was very good, we had to just get the sea lock guy over to come and show us how it all worked, and then he had to rush home just a bit early as COVID came raining down on us. So we did a pilot trial with just one pen, and that was a really good experience. Scott talked about your distribution of data over the day, and that was one thing in that pilot trial. We had loads of visits, and not really any after about 8 o'clock at night. But having that pilot trial enabled us to learn at relatively low cost. So when we did our full trial, we get a nice spread of data over the full day, and we aim to have about six visits per day. The little step ladder is pretty handy for people who are more Rebecca's size than mine <laughs> when they're filling it up. I can pour a bag of Alex <laughs> into their green feet, no problem, from the ground. <clears throat> so, we want the bulls not to be eating too much of a TMR type diet because we want the diet to be representative of what they're going to be eating out in the paddock. So, handily enough, we did a whole lot of their conversion efficiency work back in about 2011. They used lucerne hay cubes for that, and so that's what we feed the bulls in the big blue bins. And then in the green feed, we have just a kind of standard pellet that's got maize, prolumina, palm oil, and a few other grains in it. We train the bulls onto the diet a bit in the paddock, so they know the kind of smell of the feed when they get into the pen, and we do about a week of that, and we find that really helps them use the rick bins. So generally, we'll have one with its head in the bin within about five minutes of putting them in the pen. It's really incredible how curious and brave they are. We had a couple of bulls last year, we couldn't get trained to use the rick bins. That was at the CRV site, but we've got a very good girl at LIC and we had a couple of reluctant ones, but she had them eating out of her hand and eventually got them trained into that. We generally have less than 5% won't use the green feed. It's probably close to 5% last year and it's looking more like, I think it's about three bulls so far at LIC and about 200 that haven't used this year. And I think there's a bit of a staff effect on that. Uh, Fiona is really good with the bulls and she'll persist. She'll clear the pen out and leave them in there so they can have a go on their own. Yeah, we didn't realise what a difference that staff made until we got a staff member. So this is our, one of the actual green feed units. The roll of sponge on the thing over the top is because I hit my head once. <laughs> so health and safety said we had to do that. So we have a proper chute with solid sides. And you can see there's black kind of plastic filled in around the edge because some of them would try and get their little noses in there and see if they could get an extra bit of feed. They're bulls and they're hitting puberty about when we have them in the pen, so we do get a bit of riding and stuff, but that doesn't seem to cause a lot of issue in terms of interrupted visits and stuff. The shirt's long enough that they feel protected with that. So, in terms of when we're training, we basically give them ad lib access to the green bead when we put them in the pen for the first time. Our record is having a bull in there within 15 minutes. And then it, you really have to watch what the animals are doing and how often they're visiting and cut those animals that have really got the hang of it really quickly down because if you keep letting them have ad access, the 
ones that are a little bit shyer won't go and explore or just don't have the opportunity to explore because they really like the treats in there. And it's really, we've found it's really important for them to know that treat food before they go in. Because obviously animals are used to eating grass, so if they haven't experienced the pellet before, there's not a lot of attraction for them. So if we feed a bit of pellet out in the paddock, then they know the smell and it really encourages them. In. And we always make sure when we put them in the pen for the first time, we've dropped a few drops of pellets in there so they can smell that food and get a reward as soon as they go in. And we generally will wait on the shoot or have one side off for training. But on a couple of occasions, we've actually just left the shoot on and it hasn't seemed to have made too much of a difference. I think if you've got a particularly nervous animal, then you might need to take that side off. But these balls are all hand reared, so they're relatively quiet. We did have a couple last year that had been reared on a cow and they were a bit more fun. We did we had them in a pen for a couple of weeks to simmer them down a bit first and one still never simmered down and went for a ride on the track. <laughs> so we do have some data. Being breeding companies that are doing all the measuring, we're getting a lot of the data analysis to be done by a third party to give a bit of independence. So last year we measured about 280 animals. We did a few animals twice to have a bit more of a look at repeatability. We haven't really looked at that data yet. And we were getting an average of 4.6 visits per day. So we were allowing five visits per day last year. This year we've upped that to six. And about 108 visits per animal. Our general trial design is to try and do 35 days and have the first seven days basically adaptation and training but last year there was a few issues so not all the animals were in for quite as long as we would have liked but scarily enough the methane came out basically exactly as we'd expect and that's made me a little bit nervous that it looks a bit too good. <coughs> Paul did a great job of talking about all the kind of challenges we're going to face in terms of the genetic analysis and yeah we've got we've got a lot of data now and we've got a lot of thinking about how to best analyze this data and, yeah. and our next step is to validate that this works in some daughters so we're planning to do a whole lot of inseminations this year and generate daughters from the high and low bulls and see how they go so maybe there'll be a few more green feed machines coming our way and yeah, I'd just like to <laughs> say how it's been really good working with Sealock and we're seeing New Zealand's a long way from South Dakota, but we get a great deal of help. If we ever need to call, we can just video conference. Someone's always answering the phone and like, I appreciate how I'm looking at the data. So often when we're training, I might get an email from them going, hey, you're getting quite a few visits that are a bit contaminated. And it's like, yep, yep, that's okay. We're in training period, but let us know if that keeps happening. So, yeah, it's really reassuring to have that data being looked at constantly and any feedback about the shoes so you can fix them at the time. And yeah, that's me. <laughs>